I'm Scott. I know I need a haircut and a shave, but it's virus time, so who cares? This is an HP DL 380G8 LFF. Yeah, got that right. Actually, I didn't get it right. It's technically, they call it Gen 8 now. They gave up on the G and call it Gen. I don't know. It's just a marketing thing. It doesn't really matter. In this video, I'm going to be looking at turning this thing into a backup server. Now, what do I mean by backup server? Well, it's really just a file server that I'm going to be using for backups. So the things I'm going to be saying in this video and what I'm going to be showing you is applicable to most any sort of file server. I'm going to be installing CentOS 8 on this. Yes, CentOS, I know, whatever. Um, but hardware wise, this configuration would be great for FreeNAS or a ZFS configuration because I'm not going to be using hardware RAID. I'm going to be using software RAID and I'll get into why later. For now, let's take a look at this beast. It has some gigabytes of RAM. I'm actually not sure how much. If you get one of these, this clear shield comes off quite easily. It's just an air guide so that the air gets sucked along the heat sinks for the CPUs and across the RAM very neatly. These are eight gigabyte modules and there are two, four, six of them. So 48 gigs of RAM. If you're doing a ZFS install or anything where you'll find caching to be important, um, I would recommend probably more RAM than that. I mean, it depends on the size of your storage. Because this is a backup server for me, I'm not concerned about performance. I mean, I guess during a restore I would be, but this is actually going to sit off site from my house and back up shit from my house. It's going to be in a data center at a colo facility. So I'm not too concerned about performance. In fact, it's going to be on a 100 megabit internet connection, which nowadays is ridiculously slow, but they charge a lot more for a gigabit connection with unlimited bandwidth. And again, I don't really care about speed. It can plot along all night and all day if it wants, just sucking down files. It currently has 12 four terabyte drives in it. They are all HP branded. I believe these are Seagates. Yep, manufactured by Seagate data manufacturer 2015. So these are already kind of old. Um, I believe they've uh, already had a decent amount of use, but quite frankly, a good quality hard drive and one that's kept in relatively good uh, conditions, like, you know, moderately low temperature, no shock or abuse. I mean, they can last a really long time. In fact, I still embarrassingly have some hard drives in service that are dated from 2006. That's right, 2006. It's now 2020. So they're, they've been running for about 14 years straight and they show no signs of stopping. Now these are non-mission critical disks in RAID 6 arrays from, entirely. Yeah, so um, you know, I could withstand a disk failure or two. And again, non-mission critical. I'm not that crazy. Uh, for a backup server, that's really not that bad. This is going to be running uh, RAID 6 arrays, like I said, software. And the data center this is going to be located at is close enough to my house, eight, nine minutes away. So I can easily go and swap a disk out if I need to. And it can withstand two disk failures. So even though these are older disks that have been around the block, I mean, the one good thing about older disks is, you know, they're not going to suffer from an early failure because hard drives tend to fail early or late. And when, once you're in the middle, like they're a couple of years old, they're not as prone to failure. I think once you hit like the five year mark, then they start failing, which is just about where we are now. But again, good quality hard drives, man, they, they last a long time once they get over like that first couple of years hump. In my experience, I mean, this is sort of a tangent, but Backblaze is a backup company and they do a lot of hard drive statistics. Unfortunately, they don't use a lot of Western digital drives and those are the ones that I personally have had the best experience with. I know that I can start a raging debate in the comments. Like I brought that up before and people are like, no, Western digital is shitty, Seagate's the best which I don't even understand because you look at reviews for Seagate drives, they're almost always significantly lower than Western Digital on average. I don't know, use whatever you think works best, but uh, oof, I've had some bad, bad luck with Seagate. But then again, I try to buy drives that have been proven already and that have good reviews and ratings from customers. So those are going to be the drives generally that last longer. There are shitty Western Digital drives out there. I just don't generally buy them. You know what I mean? Plus, I tend to buy a lot of hard drives used, which I know seems kind of nuts, but uh, all these were used. In fact, this entire chassis was used. Um, it was kept somewhere very clean, um, probably a nice, uh, neat data center somewhere. But uh, I got this very cheap with the, f with the f well, not the four, with the 12 four terabyte hard drives. 
and 48 gigs of RAM and a very nice controller card. This came in at like 450 bucks, which is a very good deal in my opinion. The CPUs are not that great. Um, the CPUs are, I believe, six core, two gigahertz. Uh, so really fine though. In fact, more than enough for a file server, like unless you're gonna be doing ZFS with a lot of um, compression, like if you're using GZIP9 or something, then you're gonna need very powerful CPUs to get any kind of good throughput. But um, everything I'm gonna be backing up to this for the most part is gonna be already compressed before it's sent across the wire. So I'm gonna have no compression turned on at the uh, array level or at the file system level or anywhere else because the actual files are generally TARs that are gzipped or actually raw disk images that are gzipped off of snapshots and then sent to this machine. So encryption and CPU power, not a big concern for me. You do need a moderate amount of CPU horsepower for array management and for data striping and RAID calculations. Like if you're using RAID 6 or RAID Z 2 or 3, like, did I say RAID Z? RAID Z 2 or 3? Um, it's going to take some CPU power. If you're using a, here's the thing. If you're connecting a file server via a gigabit connection, it's going to be really hard unless you have a lot of users and a lot of uh, IOPS. It's going to be really hard to saturate the actual disks as opposed to saturating the network. Like the network is going to be your bottleneck. If you have multiple gigabit connections or 10 gigabits going to it, then yes, you'll really need to think about the speed of your uh, hardware here at this level. But um, otherwise, I mean, like like I said, this is going to be fed with a 100 megabit connection over a VPN. So real throughput's probably going to be more like 60 megabit, 80 megabit, something like that. Um, definitely performance is not a requirement for me. But this would handle a gigabit just fine with a relatively low user count or um, process count accessing it. The DL380 is a nice little machine. Um, you can pick these up really cheap. This actually though, this was sold as a Store One 2900. It's basically like HP's pre-packaged uh, file server product. Dell has a comparable one, the DR4100, I believe. I actually have one of those back there. I'll show, yeah, there it is. But just like with Dell, um, their store one products are just rebadged standard HP servers. Like I said, this is a DL380. That's actually an R720 XD. And you can sometimes find some good deals because people aren't always looking for these, like on eBay. They're looking for DL380s, so they might not be searching for store one 2900s. So um, supply is a lot lower, but demand is very low because, again, people don't really know what they're after. You should know that the... Dell, yeah, that thing, the DR4100, and this, they run custom software, but the hardware is all generic in both uh, HP and Dell. So you won't have any problem at all loading um, FreeNAS, Linux, whatever the hell you want on one of these machines. In fact, that one back there is running FreeNAS. And like I said, this is going to be running CentOS. I've already loaded an OS on this, um, but I haven't fully configured it yet. And I might reload the OS because I'm, I'm starting to change my mind a little bit, but this is really going to be about the hardware, not the software. So let's take a quick look at what we have here. I'm actually going to take out one of these PCI riser cages because I have another DL380 that was actually sold as a DL380 that only has one cage. That I'm going to be using as a virtual machine host. So I'm going to want the extra PCIe slots, I think, for like network cards and other and um, external SAS HBAs. So this one is actually going to come out and a uh, blank is going to be put in here from the other server. In this particular riser cage, we have a Kingston HyperX SSD. This did not come with the server from eBay. Uh, coming from eBay, it was just this RAID controller, which I'll show you in a second. And this was completely empty. I'm going to be using the HyperX Predator to boot off of. Uh, these are nice little cards. I'm a bit old now. I think there's M2 SATA. They're not even NVMe. But uh, in a couple of my older workstation machines, I'm still running these. Uh, they're reasonably fast. They're very reliable in my experience. And uh, yeah, generally good quality. So I'm just going to have a single boot volume for this because I'm not too concerned about redundancy with boot. 
Uh, because it's a backup server, I mean, I can, as long as I replace it and get it back up and running within a day or two, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because I actually already have another backup server that is in my house, but on the second floor of the house, all this shit's in the basement. So this way, if my basement floods or someone comes in and steals all this shit, like I still have that, those backups upstairs. Um, and also it makes restore times much quicker because those are on a gigabit connection. Uh, this offsite server is going to have the same backups as upstairs, but this is really just in case my house burns down, you know, knock on wood or some other catastrophe befalls me here. Um, this would still have all the data on it. So I'm not too concerned about the reliability of its boot. Um, otherwise, I would definitely use a RAID volume for boot, which is, by the way, one thing I like a lot more about the R720XDs from Dell is that they have optional, but uh, obviously if you look for it on eBay, you can find it, two rear-mounted 2.5-inch drives. Um, they're standard, like, um, they're standard SAS drives or SAS bays. You can stick a SATA drive, you can stick a SAS drive in there, it doesn't matter. Um, SSD, spinning flat or hard drives, doesn't, it doesn't matter what you stick in there as long as it's 2.5 inch and either SATA or SAS. And those are intended by Dell for boot. So the DR4100 I have originally from Dell shipped with those two drives as the boot volume and then all the disks up front were for storage. On the, what is this called again? The Store 1 2900, this thing, there's no separate boot drives. It actually boots off of the storage volume, which I'm generally not a fan of. There's nothing, there's nothing technically wrong with doing that. If you want to do that, go ahead. The reason I don't like doing it is because if I want to move the storage to a different machine, the storage is just more portable. Like in this case, in this backup server, that probably won't happen. But if it's a VM server, um, I want the VM hypervisor to boot from somewhere else in the data volume because I might want to take, like, let's say I have an external disk pack. I might want to take that and put it on a different VM host, just migrate those VMs onto different hardware, and I don't want to lose the operating system or migrate the operating system with it. Not necessary, but um, again, I just prefer separate boot volumes. So that's why I'm sticking this card in here because there are no other places to put boot disks in this machine. But I digress. Let me get to this other riser card. I mean, riser cage. This is how it shipped from HP. These are a little tight. There we go. And this has a RAID controller in it. Now, the weird thing is this really doesn't seem to be made for performance because the back plane for the drives actually supports two four-lane SAS connectors. Um, and this is just running with one four lane SAS connector. So half the bandwidth is if you were to use both connectors. But this does have an external SAS connector, which is nice. Um, so let me just disconnect that. And then it has a battery backup. The battery is in here. The wire runs around here and comes into the RAID card here. And this is the cache module. So let me pull out the battery. And again, I'm not going to be using this. And let me get a little closer in here. And this is just a generic HP RAID controller. It's not specific to the Store 1 family of products. The model number I'm going to put on the screen because it's not evident from this. And I already forgot. There's a sticker on here that says it's a 1 gig cache module, which isn't great, but it is not horrible. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be saving this for potentially... Uh, to potentially use somewhere else in another project. Because I do use hardware RAID, it's just uh, not in situations like this. Which I guess brings up a slight digression, but a good point. Software RAID versus hardware RAID. Hardware RAID, these are, gonna be, these are two very general statements, so don't panic. Hardware RAID is generally faster. Software RAID, I think, is more manageable and more portable. That and portability for me is really the important thing here because by portable, I mean with hardware RAID, you're generally stuck with the same brand at least of RAID controller. For example, if I created a RAID array using this controller card, which is an HP controller, now it's probably an LSI controller or, um, oh my god, I'm having a brain fart and who LSI is now branded as, yeah, them. 
but generally this will an array created with this card will only be compatible with other hp hbas or raid controllers and even then it probably won't be compatible with earlier versions of uh or earlier controllers like earlier iterations of firmware and you can't even guarantee that it's going to be the array is going to be portable across different models of hp raid controllers even if they're sort of contemporaries of each other so for me again performance is not mission critical here what is critical for me is the ability to a move the array if i need to for example if i need to replace this hardware and i want to replace it with dell hardware easy enough if it's just a standard linux md raid array that can be moved to pretty much any system it also helps if i need to recover the data off these drives because it's i can plug them into any old system i want even just temporarily just to mess with the array. Um, it's particularly valuable for a backup server like this that's off-site, which I know is a use case not many of you are gonna be looking at, but if I need to do a restore of significant quantities of data, I could pull all 12 hard drives out of this, bring them home, put them in an external array or a disk shelf, hook them up to any old computer I want and recover the data locally. I can even hook them up to a uh, VM host via SAS cable and have a very fast recovery time if I'm recovering, let's say, VM snapshot images. So yeah, portability and manageability too, because in order to, well, there's a lot of ways to manage hardware RAID. You can manage it through ILO or IDRAC if you have like the enterprise uh, licenses for them, I think. I'm not 100% familiar with how uh, they allow you to manage these things. And otherwise, to do it from the operating system level, you have to install a whole crapload of custom tools that are specific to the manufacturer, um, sometimes even specific to the version or family of card. And uh, also, if the card dies, like these cards can get fairly expensive, and replacing it then can get tricky because I have to order a very specific card, make sure it's compatible with the array I've created, and hope it arrives on time from eBay because I'm not going to buy a brand new from the manufacturer, blah, blah, blah. So... I tend to shy away from hardware raid when possible. Um, places I do use hardware raid is for is in virtual machine hosts where I do want a very performant disk pack and I have a lot of drives in raid 10 or well raid 10 for the most part and I just want good performance above all else. That was a bit rambly but so what am I going to replace that with because I still need to connect these 12 disks and this backplane to the motherboard. We need something in between there. And for that, I'm going to be using this very, very old, very low-tech Super Micro HBA. It's model number AOC SASLP MV8. Now, before you run out and buy one of these, these can be had very cheaply. These are not compatible with FreeBSD, at least not without loading um, third party drivers. Also, I read in some forums that they're not super reliable. People have had problems with them. So um, they do make me a little nervous. Again, this is for a backup server that's going to be monitored. If it fails, I have more of these. I can replace it in a decent amount of time. So I'm not too worried. Uh, what I do like using for ZFS, and I'll be right back. I'll give you a clue, though. That's right. The venerable Dell Perk H310. This one's actually, like, rusting. What the fuck? That's weird. It's just been in my basement. It's incredibly well humidity controlled down here. This is an older SAS card. Um, it is 6 gigabit. And it does have two 4 channel ports. So it's reasonably fast. It's very reliable. I run a bunch of these. And I have not had a single problem with one. Uh, this says copyright 2011 on it. So that's right. It was designed 9 years ago. And this card is probably eight, nine years old. Um, they don't make these new anymore. You can get them on eBay cheap. And they are just generic LSI cards. Now, these are RAID controllers when they're called Perk H310s. The thing is, these are generic LSI cards. Um, so generic, in fact, that you can just load any old LSI firmware that's compatible onto it, and it takes away all the Dell branding, and it's no longer has anything to do with Dell. I believe these cards are all, have also been used by IBM, and they've also just been sold under the LSI name in general. Um, that's just the chipset. It may be a slightly different form factor. I'm gesturing like you can see this. And I actually do like this form factor. It can be equipped with a high profile or low profile bracket. And in fact, the reason that I have this Super Micro card and the reason it says Perk H310 on it 
which is a big fat lion super micros case is because one of these servers behind me that big fat one there has 36 drives in it. it is a super micro chassis it was sold by co-raid which i guess was some kind of a storage vendor i'm not really familiar with them i got it on ebay as usual and it has a super micro two cpu motherboard in it older generation that has until i want to say x5697 cpus that might be a lie but they're um the higher end of that model range and from that generation older tech but still quite performant um i think i get like around eight nine hundred megabytes per second read and write uh, linear off my main array on that which is a uh, raid z2 and a few raid z2s uh, all stacked together anyway performance you know so again when you're talking about file servers unless your workload's very heavy you generally do not need modern super clean awesome hardware you might want that for reliability that is my personal file server so reliability is not a huge issue for me it has been running fine for the last five four and a half years that system came with i believe five of these super micro cards i went to load free bsd which is to say free nas on there and it wouldn't recognize any of these cards i read up on it these cards are okay they weren't that great they weren't compatible so i went on ebay and got a bunch of perk h310s and flash them from IR mode to IT mode. So if you look up on Google flash LSI model number IR to IT, you'll probably find out easily how to flash over pretty much any LSI card that that is possible with from IR to IT. IR is initiator raid, I think it stands for. IR mean the R means raid, so it's a raid controller. IT means initiator target, which means it's just the initiator and the target just talking to each other directly so it's just an hba with no raid functionality so that is what you want for free nas and for zfs in general and in fact i would say that's what you want for linux raid uh configurations as well as well as windows software in fact any should just generalize to any software raid that's what you want you want the system to talk directly to the disks with no raid controller or other nonsense in between them now that is for a bunch of reasons, but I think foremost of which is that this way the system can read the smart codes off of the hard drives. So it can detect early failure, it can get statistics from the hard drives, shit like that. It's also so you can set up, if you bother, uh, the correct geometry for the drives, like the correct starting sectors and blah blah blah. Um, I'm not going to get into that. Like I said, this is more about hardware than software, but uh, the Perk H310, I think, even though it's getting a little old now, so... You know, I bought this, I think, when I was making that system back there, so four or five years ago, back when it was only about four or five years old itself. No, less, probably three or four years old itself. So you might want to look at newer options. This is what I have. This is what I'm using. The one thing about these Super Micro cards is they are only um, four-lane cards, as opposed to Perk H310s, which are eight PCIe lanes. Um, I believe that's not, not just bullshit. Like, that connector is not just filling out that much space it's actually that but again performance not an issue for me and for example on that machine behind me oh i'm still on that shit i thought i was on a different camera um on that machine behind me like i said there are five more six hbas in there for the 36 drive so it's spreading the io pretty well over the entire uh pcie bus and in fact with all those drives working their asses off even though they're only four lane cards it would still easily saturate the bus if all the hard drives are reading at the same time in fact on that system the pcie bus might be the bottleneck because i have one of the arrays is 33 drives and I figured it peak they could do about 100 megabytes per second of read so i mean that's a shit ton of data so i'm not necessarily recommending these super micro cards these are just what i have i'm not using the h310 they have here because i'm saving it for something where i might need a little more performance or as a replacement in case one goes bad in that uh giant super micro server behind me and like i said more than enough performance for the purpose here okay so when you're putting pcie cards into riser cages like this you want to keep accessibility in mind so for example this card has those two ports if i were to put it on the bottom those ports would be accessible until i went and installed the much longer 
HyperX card on top of it, in which case those ports would become fairly inaccessible. Now, I could plug in the SAS cables first, or I could like really uh, jam my fingers in there in weird angles and try to get it in, but just for, pra for practical purposes, it's going to be better to mount this card on top because it's very short and has ports that need to be accessed. And this has absolutely nothing that needs to be accessed by me, so this can be on the bottom. Um, if this were a very high-performance SSD that gave off a lot of heat, you might want to consider cooling and leave a blank space between them, and maybe even, even though it might ruin HP's idealized cooling design, um, you might want to put a slotted bracket in there so air flows over the card <laughs> that way, I guess. But this card is going to get very minimal use as it's just going to be the operating system and it's really just going to be used at boot and to write some log files, which is basically going to be no use at all. As such, now this is kind of a weird angle because I'm like holding this aloft, trying to keep it in focus. That's more or less in focus. And uh, yeah, I don't necessarily recommend installing cards at this weird angle. Yeah, this is uh, kind of silly. But there you go. Okay, so it's in there. Wonderful. Oh, I have one other card. Shit. I have one other card that I'm going to put in here that I got to show you. I'll be right back. This is kind of like Christmas because I just got this uh, box today. It should have some external SAS HBAs in it. Let's hope. So if I wasn't ripped off. No, I just uh, I usually buy this kind of stuff from like real bulk style power sellers. Just because usually, especially, they know how to package Cards. Although I've gotten some cards like that are packaged really sketchily from decent sellers. Like no anti-static protection at all. Let's see if that's the case here. It looks like we're in luck because these look like they're uh, nice static bags or anti -st Oh yeah, anti-static bubble wrap with anti-static bags inside. Very nice. And these come with the full height brackets and the half height brackets installed. I believe the DL380 you can get with different configuration of um, riser cages. But the ones I got just came with full height cages. I kind of like the, I got to say, so far I prefer the Dell R720XD line over this because of the two rear mounted drive bays. But also it has, I believe, more PCIe slots as standard, even though some are half height. But I kind of like the mix of half height and full height because it gives some options. I'm kind of only bitching about that because I have some half height with this exact RAID controller, but I don't have the full height brackets for them, or I didn't until just now. And so I had to order new cards because I couldn't find just the brackets. That's the lie. I could find just the brackets, but they were shipping from China and we're going to be about like three weeks or a month to be delivered. I didn't want to wait that long because I got to get the server up and running. This is an older generation of the card I thought I was getting. This is actually an LSI branded card. This is just a straight HPA. I do not believe it has any RAID functionality or capability for RAID functionality, though it does have a big heat sink, so maybe it does. I could be lying out my ass. In fact, I don't even remember what model number this is, but fortunately it's printed on the back. It is a SAS 92078E. Now performance here, like I said, is not a huge issue. Apparently I'm insane. It is exactly the same card that I had. For some reason I thought it had a silver heat sink and a slightly newer looking uh, board. But anyway, and this was my other option. This is a very old LSI card, um, external HBA, same style connectors on it. This is dated copyright 2006 to 2007. I, I thought it might be wise to use something a little bit newer than this. I think this might only be 3 gigabit. This is a SAS 3801E-HP, so I guess this was made for HP. But uh, yeah, I'm going to pass on this and go with these slightly newer ones. I'm not seeing a copyright date, but anyway, these are definitely 6 gigabit cards and two four-lane ports on the back. Politely labeled SAS, in case you uh, didn't realize. But like I said, the one thing I was missing were the full-height brackets, which now I have. And you might think it's foolish to buy <laughs> two brand new, well not brand new, but two new used HBAs just to get brackets, but I'm going to end up using these in some other product project that does take half height cards, so it's not a waste of money, they will get used eventually. So I just got to swap out the brackets, and uh, yeah, 
So what do I mean by switching out the brackets? Well, for the most part, any card that's this height, like half height, uh, let me grab a full height card just as a counter example. This is a full height card. You can see if I bring the riser cage in here, if I were to install this, it takes up the full height of the riser cage. And in fact, if it wasn't a riser cage, if it was just a standard computer chassis, it would take up the full height of the card slot. In fact, you can see it actually goes a little bit above the bracket here. You can get cards that use a full height bracket that are shorter than this, but maybe not as short as this one. Like they could be anywhere in between. But if they're any taller than this card, they will not fit in a half height position. So you got to be careful also when you're ordering online. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Like, I mean, you can tell by the proportions that this is a half height card. But you can't always tell if you're buying, let's say, a card that's just a little bit taller than this and has a full height bracket, if it's going to be adaptable to a half height bracket. But any card that you can buy that comes with a half height bracket, I don't want to say literally any because I'm sure there are exceptions, but any card that does come in a half height variant will be adaptable to a full height bracket because it's really just about adding more metal but obviously it won't work vice versa because this physically will not fit in a half height slot. And I mean, generally the benefit of half height cards for the end user is that you can cram more of them into a system of the same size than you can full height cards. Of course, for some systems, they only have uh, full height card slots and it really doesn't matter because they're oriented vertically. For example, I have some um, four unit servers back there, a couple of Dell R910s and an HP DL580 G7, all of which have full height card slots. And there's no point in having half heights because they're all oriented vertically and the chassis are this tall in the first place. So half height wouldn't give any advantage there. But for rack mount servers like this, where the cards lie on their sides, well, obviously you can put, I believe you could get three of these in the space of two of these if they're lying sideways. So, they're horizontally. Sideways doesn't sound very technical. And now we have a full height SAS HBA. External SAS HBA. Oh, I should say, why a external SAS HBA? Well, I happen to have another like 12 plus four terabyte hard drives laying around. And I figure why not just double the amount of storage attached to this bitch. Um, and so I'm gonna attach a disc shelf to it with again for why do I keep trying to say four 12 terabyte hard drives? 12, four terabyte hard drives. Uh, let's get back to this riser cage. Take out these blanks. Now, one thing I should note about these blanks is um, they have a little notch there. See that notch that sticks down? That actually goes into the screw hole there. And that's kind of critical. If you try to put any old rando filler blank into here, it is uh, not going to stay because basically the way these are held in place is this closes on top of them and sort of just like presses them down. And so as long as that tab's there, it will keep it from popping out. But if that tab's not there, it's just going to fall straight out like that and uh, rattle around inside your server. And if you don't realize that and you put the server back together and it's kind of just sitting there all nice as can be. And then let's say you pick the server up, walk it over to the rack and mount it or worse yet, put it in your car, it bounces around, that bracket could shake loose. And if you don't notice it, then uh, you got a metal bracket rattling around inside your server, potentially shorting things out. So uh, do be on the lookout for that. These are threaded holes, so you can screw the cards down. You just need screws with very small heads, which I actually have. You know what? Let me do the belt and suspenders me method because if I'm just mounting this in my basement and all I'm doing is picking this up and carrying it over to that rack and sliding it in gently, and then it's just going to sit there. I'm not too concerned if the cards uh, are not like really clamped down well, but this is going to go in the car with me to a data center. And um, why not just really uh, secure them down nicely? And especially when you're dealing with things with external connectors, uh, those can take some stress and some torque. So it really is a good idea to secure the cards as well as possible. That being said, I mean, if you're not going to, it's not like you're messing around with these ports a lot. I mean, they really should just be sitting there and minimally touched. So honestly, I don't always screw my cards down, but uh, why not do it for the sake of YouTube and completeness? 
Whew, boy, you can really tell I prepared my myself silly for this video. Anyway, these are computer screws. Politely labeled. I'm just going to lay them on top of the CPUs because that's a good idea. If this falls over, that won't cause any problems at all. Uh, I have a fairly wide variety of screws, and in fact, I know I have some screws with very with flat heads on them. Yes, this. But this is the screw I'm talking about. Very low profile head. Don't even know what these were sold. I have a lot of these, and they're like from the 90s, early 2000s. I think they came with CD-ROMs back in the day. I don't know why. I don't recall. If anyone knows, uh, post in the comments. It's kind of, um, now i got to refocus this camera. It's kind of like a weird nostalgic thing for me, because I, I don't really see those screws too often. And now it seems like pretty much everything's gone um, toolless. Not everything, but, you know, you're seeing a lot more toolless stuff. And, geez, back in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, we had to screw everything together. We were like animals back then. I know computer cases still use screws, but uh, especially the enterprise hardware doesn't use it too much. It actually had a relatively low-profile head. And just by the as a general piece of advice, as I rummage through screws, um, you know, you could organize your screws better than I do, but there's another one. Don't throw out computer screws. In fact, as a DIY guy, I generally say don't throw out any screws or nuts or bolts unless it becomes completely impractical to store them. Not that they're generally that huge, so I can't imagine it would become that impractical for most people, but you never know when random ass screws will come in handy. Like those, like these flat head screws. Um, I know flat head is a term for a screwdriver blade as well, but you know what I mean? These heads are extremely flat. Uh, these I don't find use for too often. That's why I have tons of them still sitting in that box. But here, it's a nice use because I think they will clear the uh, the holes there. Now, this HBA I will put in the next card slot along because, again, it, oh, shit, this is really awkward to do at this angle. I don't usually recommend slamming cards against each other as you put them in. But anyway, there we go. Nice, satisfying click as it goes in there. But again, nothing to access in there. And this is really like a heat trap now, because like you can see it's a heat sink on this one. For sure, if this was doing, like I said, I'm not even sure if this is RAID capable. I'm guessing it is because of the heat sink. If it was doing RAID operations, that might get pretty hot. So you'd really want to give that some breathing room. In fact, that is why it comes with a vented bracket. But uh, just acting as a simple HBA, a disk interface, um, really shouldn't get too hot. So... It's really, everything's really packed in there. I'm okay with that. Uh, I think I'm okay with that. Ooh, yes. Look at that. Those screws go right into those recesses. And brilliant. And now these cards are rock solid in there. That's now what we'll have on the ass end of the server. Nice HyperX logo. Kingston really showing off there. Uh, a very modest Perk H310 logo, which isn't even accurate which is going to cause me confusion later if I'm like, oh, what I put on this server? Oh, an H310. Anyway, and then the uh, external HPA. So, very nice. Now, one sort of interesting thing I noticed about these ch this chassis is that these two uh, riser cages are identical. And even more weirdly, they both have these little pins on them. See the little pin? That is for the lid to latch into the uh, top of it. Like, that portion that drags the lid closed, that interfaces with that pin. So interestingly, in order to keep them identical, they both have that, even though it's only really necessary on one of them. And uh, yeah, there we go from the top. Uh, this port, a little less accessible, but uh, it's fine. I mean, the cable will have no problem just going right through there. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll throw this into the chassis and then I'll clean up the existing RAID cabling and add some of my own. And then I like these newer HP chassis and that it's like a half turn to lock these cards down. It used to be like thumb screws and it would require a whole bunch of turning and like lifting and maneuvering. This is a much neater design. I like it. Great job, HP. And now, like I said, I'm leaving one of these riser cages out and it's going to be this one. Uh, so I could have, I presume I could put this mod, this uh, riser cage here and leave this one as the blank. So now this existing cable that's here that plugs into the back plane i believe it's only a four lane cable and so the back oh you gotta take the whole fan cage out to get that out okay 
Well, fortunately, that's very modular in this machine. All the fans pop out like that in one neat uh, little module. It's got some foam under there to keep air from flowing where it shouldn't be flowing. And uh, everything's well labeled here. Yeah, I mean, it's very neat. Um, in some ways, like, it, it's funny because Dell and HP do a lot of things very differently. And there are just some things I prefer about Dell and some things I prefer about HP. Kind of uh, improvising camera angles here, and this is not super well lit. But uh, here's the back plane, and here's where that SAS cable is plugged in, and then the route comes on the other side to the controller at HPA. And it actually gets routed like between this plastic piece and this metal piece. And this metal piece, presumably, which holds the, which holds the fan carrier, fan cage, that just comes off, slides off very easily. I like that. Um, yeah, it's a very tight setup in there. But uh, again, well engineered by HP because it's very easy to remove and reroute the cable. So now I have a, I feel, I feel like it's Mystery Science Theater 3000. I just need a hat for this thing. Anyway. I also got these cables, which are made in China. I mean, all cables are made in China nowadays, but these are particularly Chinese. I got them off Amazon. They were just the right length and the right type of cable. And we'll take a quick look at them. It comes with a warranty and integral card, which has some interesting statements on it. We sincerely appreciate, well, dear customers and friends. I guess I'll consider myself a customer at this point. We sincerely appreciate you for buying Cable Decon. Also, the brand name is Cable Decon. Like, Cable Deconnection? Like, why would you want a cable disconnected? Like, it's, it's just a bad name. Bad um, connotation there. Uh, we sincerely appreciate you for buying Cable Decon products. Your satisfaction is our motivation to do better. According to the instructions of this product... There are instructions? There are no instructions. For the product quality problem under normal use, Cable Decon will stand the warranty when the product is the warranty period, is in the warranty period. They didn't fuck that up, I did. It is our new way. This card can also be used as integral card. Ten pieces of the cards for eight points. With 40 points, you can have a 7% discount on the basis of the original price in our store for any product. Semicolon. The full 80 points, any products can be obtained a discount of 8% on the basis of the original price. It can be exchanged at any time when you have full points. I mean, I like the fact, you know, the packaging's reasonably nice. I like the fact that they gave a warranty card, an 18-month warranty. I mean, it's had reasonable reviews on Amazon, but uh, not many reviews, which could mean they're just fake uh, priming reviews, like that the company's priming the pump with good reviews. But hey, I didn't actually read the reviews, so maybe they were legit. I don't want to shit on the company unnecessarily. For all I know, they could be absolutely great. In fact, I'm hoping they're absolutely great because I'm putting them in a server. Again, this is a backup server, not a mission-critical production server. So if these cables are shit, it is not the end of the world. Since I'm using a generic HBA, I can't imagine it... Ma oh, you know what? Let me get the battery out of the way, because... This battery backup should stay with that card that I took out of here because I might use it in a different server at some point. Stick that back in there. This actually has the capacity to hold two batteries, which this camera can't tell you. Yeah, there's two battery positions, so you can presumably have two BBU RAID cards in there or one card that takes two batteries. I don't know. The world is your oyster. So anyway, I'm going to mount route these cables relatively neatly. Yeah, sorry folks, I didn't really set up the cameras in a super ideal fashion for this. But uh, what I'm doing isn't crazy. There are two SAS ports on the back of the back plane, which I've just plugged that cable into. I'm going to route the cable around here, all nice and neat. And I'm going to do the same thing with this one. Now, I read online that each of these ports will communicate with half of the drives. I got to imagine that's just when talking about standard... Um, like initiator target HBAs, because obviously the RAID controller that came with this was able to use a single cable and a single one of those ports to communicate with all 12 drives. Um, that's really like more of a proprietary HP concern. There we go. And uh, yeah, there you can see 
I put this thing back in place and the two raid cables are running under there. And then these are a little longer than necessary. You know, I always tend to buy cables longer than necessary um, because you can always just sort of do this with them. And I don't like, I don't think it would matter which one is like port A, which is port B. And in fact, they're not labeled on the back plane. So I'm just going to plug the top port into port A on the SAS connector, which is port zero to three. So yeah, just now the only thing is with cables like these, you don't want to bend them too tightly or too vigorously. Um, you want to be gentle with them. And also these connectors, they're not, in fact, I'm going to stick my head in here just so I make sure I get that connected perfectly and don't shove it in a weird angle, but you want to keep the bends nice and gentle. You want to be very kind to these these connectors because they're not rugged. They're not really meant to be plugged and unplugged like a million times, like a USB connector would be like pretty much every, any connector you'll find out there as a certain design limitation for how many times it can be connected and disconnected. Like the manufacturer will specify that as part of the, of the well, specifications for the connector. And I think with these type of internal SAS connectors, they're not rated for a tremendous number of connections and disconnections before they'll start to fail or get flaky. Uh, you know, it might be something like a hundred or 500 cycles, whereas like a USB connector, I don't know, it should be thousands. I would imagine. And I put the fan cage back in. I'm assuming the server would not even start up without... Oh, this is interesting. Without the fans. I think a couple of these fans might have been replaced somewhere along the line. Because we got a Nidec Ultra Flow in green, like that. Another one, and then a Delta. I think that's the Delta fan. Oh yeah, Delta Electronics, yep. So I wonder if these two on the end were replaced at some point. And then uh, it's all Deltas thereafter. They look physically identical, like they're clearly meant to be replacements. Oh no, the blades are a slightly different like angle and junk. Whatever, that's not really terribly important. What I have found though, is if you have a home lab like I do, which is going maybe a little absurdly outside the realm of home lab at this point. Well, there, I really shunked it down. Oh, maybe those Nidex are actually have a different flow rate. Maybe they're a little more powerful because they're lined up perfectly with the power supplies. So maybe it's to get extra airflow on the power supplies. Although usually they're independently controlled anyway, so I, I doubt that's the case. They're probably just replacements or maybe, you know, as they're manufacturing the server, they ran out of the deltas and just started using Nidex or vice versa. I'm really putting too much thought into this. It doesn't matter. All the fans work. I've tested the server. I've installed an operating system on it. I know it's fine. And so, yeah, uh, despite getting a little rambly in there, that is really all that's required to take an HP Store 1 2900 or pretty much any HP DL380 G8 and uh, convert it into a ZFS free NAS or just Linux RAID or even Windows software RAID compatible machine. Um, as long as the drivers are available for the HBAs you decide to use. Again, wouldn't use that super micro card with free NAS. I would use or free BSD entirely. I personally use one of my old Perk H310s. Many other cards are available, but those are, again, cheap and reliable, in my opinion. Um, I get all my stuff off eBay. I don't think anything in here... Oh, that is not true. The only things that were bought new in here were the two SAS cables. And it's not that I'm against buying them on eBay. It's just I realized I needed them and I wanted to get them more quickly, so I got them from Amazon. But eBay is my go-to for pretty much everything in this basement was purchased on eBay. And if not eBay, Amazon, but all the cool servers and cameras and shit were all picked up, used on eBay. It's the best way to get a bang for your buck. I mean, buying these servers new for like a home lab or even a small business. I think servers, they're like cars. I mean, they say a car loses a lot percent of its value when you drive it off the lot. Servers, it's a lot like that. Like the newest, like finest technology from Dell and HP will cost significantly more than a server that's maybe a couple of years old off eBay. Like, a ridiculous amount more. The only thing you lose when you buy it off eBay, in my opinion, is the ability to, you know... They just say the ability to return it, but I usually buy from power sellers, uh, people who do accept returns and will honor their um, their guarantee on a, on a system. 
And I usually look for, especially if it's a more expensive system, a 30 day guarantee or something like that from the seller. So that's not too much of an issue. Um, what you're really losing is the support. Some support contracts are transferable. Uh, they follow the system, not the owner. If you buy them used off eBay, you may have a difficulty getting support and you probably won't be able to get free support or included support. But I think for companies, the main reason not to buy used shit off eBay is the matter is a matter of support and a warranty as the most companies look for. My personal opinion, I mean, if it's a super mission critical server, obviously if you're a bank or like a hospital, you, know, you want to buy brand new servers with all the best warranty and service contracts and all that other shit. No question. But if you're a small business running a semi mission critical server, you can buy two high end, good quality used servers for the price of one brand new server, which will have lower specs. Like even if you're talking a slightly newer generation of technology, like if you're talking a G8 versus a G9 server, I still think you're better off for most applications buying a G8 unless you also need the highest possible performance available out there. Um, these HP servers and Dell servers, for the most part, they will run for years without a problem. 24-7. Like, I've, I've actually almost never had to throw out one of these servers due to it failing. I've gotten rid of them due to obsolescence. But even for obsolescence sake, if I bought a server that was two years newer, and I'm going to be using the server for, let's say, in one capacity or another for 10 years... Like, is it worth getting that extra two years of use out of it for double the price? To me, no. Again, depends on your application. If you're running a home lab, if you're dicking around for your own personal use, even if you have a small business, buy used servers, even buy used computers for your employees. I mean, every laptop that I have, I got used. Um, those I tend to buy like two or three years old. I look for ones that are in really pristine condition uh, with that have the absolute highest available specs as when they came out and they're still really good i don't know my personal opinion brand new servers or i don't want to say a ripoff because they're obviously not a ripoff for a lot of companies but they're a ripoff if you're a home lab user you know if you're someone like me just running servers for fun and or profit i just can't see myself spending out uh, shelling out like three times the price for basically the same server just with one generation newer cpu and uh, possibly some f fancier lights in the front. And I think this uses DDR3, so I'd get DDR4 RAM. Again, it all depends on your needs. I don't need super high performance in general out of my servers. And even if what you're after is super high performance, it's doubtful that if you're a home lab user or a small business, you're going to be able to afford the absolute top of the line CPUs in a brand new HP or Dell server. They're extraordinarily expensive. But you go back one generation, you can get some pretty fucking fast CPUs with high clock rates and a lot of cores. I don't know, I digress, but uh, yeah, there's uh, there's plenty of good stuff out there to be had on eBay. And um, you don't even know, need to know where to look when it comes to servers. I mean, like, just look for a power seller, a seller with like 5, 10, 15, 100,000 user ratings and like 99 plus percent positive. You're probably not going to go wrong. Um, also look at the pictures, make sure the server's in physically good condition. Even the power sellers do sell some servers in really shitty condition. Like they were clearly banged around from warehouse to warehouse before, you know, being liquidated over and over again before they get a hold of them. Um, like this server, I mean, you could not tell this was used. Like it looked brand new. And that's generally been my experience as long as it passes muster, mustard, passes the muster, <laughs> pass the mustard, please. Why'd I do that? Um, on the picks. So, uh, yeah, so many good deals to be had. Uh, if you're still with me, I appreciate it. There is one more short rant I want to go on about software raid, and one reason I didn't mention about why it can be quite advantageous. And that is because, as I said, these are SAS drives. Four terabyte SAS drives, even on the used market, can get pretty expensive. And I don't really need the performance of SAS drives, and I don't need, I don't even know. If no, these are only single channel drives, I think. Hmm. So these don't need to be SAS drives. In fact, if one of these drives fails, I don't want to have to replace it with a SAS drive. I have a lot of four terabyte SATA drives sitting around my house 
unused, besides the ones I'm putting in the disc shelf that's going with this system. And so if one of these fails, I'm not going to replace it with a SAS drive, I'm going to replace it with a SATA drive. Sounds simple, doesn't sound like an issue. However, the real problem is that the RAID controller that came with the system does not support the mixing of SAS and SATA drives. In fact, a lot of RAID controllers do not support the mixing of SAS and SATA drives. You can mix them on the same backplane, on the same card, you just can't mix them within the same array. So if I built a 12 disc array using this card on this system, I would always have to replace these drives with SAS drives, which then would require me to go out and buy some four terabyte SAS drives and preferably keep a couple in stock for failures. And I'm using four terabyte SATA drives in other systems. So it makes sense for me to always have a couple extra SATA drives on hand. Uh, plus, I have a couple other like random capacity drives, like uh, a couple of six terabyte uh, SATA drives that are kind of being unused. And uh, in an ideal world, I could just throw one of those in and you can use a larger capacity disc in a RAID array than the other, di the other member discs. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, I'd be stuck trying to use SAS and that would just end up being a huge bitch for me. If you're doing software RAID, no software RAID that I know of cares about mixing drive types. As long as the operating system can communicate with the drive, you can add it to the array. Mm, I should back that up and say that Windows software RAID will not allow you to use USB disks. At least not on Windows Server. I don't know. Maybe on Windows 10 it would. But, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons why not to use USB drives for a RAID array. But there are some reasons why you might want to. Uh, for example, for boot volumes, you might want to use two USB keys to boot up a system uh, for redundancy if they're not going to move. Some systems have internal USB ports, so they're not going to get tampered with or, uh, or moved around. In fact, there's a USB port in here. I'm not sure if you can boot off that, but uh, I know a lot of uh, Dell systems, you can boot off internal USB drives. In fact, I don't know if it's running right now. I have a Dell T1102 that has mirrored internal USB flash drives that I use for booting. It's a router, so performance is not important. It just boots and then basically doesn't use the disk at all, except for tiny smidgens of logs here and there. Um, but I wouldn't recommend running a mission critical, like RAID 6 multi disk array on USB. I'm not saying never do it, I'm just saying it's not my preferred thing to do. But uh, for the most part, software RAID does not care about how your disk is interfacing with the system or what type of disk it is. Um, another disadvantage about hardware RAID controllers, a lot of them will not let you mix SSDs and hard drives. On the face of it, that sounds like a terrible idea. Why would you mix those two? But that can be valuable if you're trying to migrate an array from hard drive to SSD and gradually replace member disks until you end up with all SSDs. On software RAID, that's not a problem. That's very easy to do. Um, but with hardware RAID, I know Dell and HP, for the most part, at least actually for all the cards I've seen, do not support mixing hard drives and SSDs within the same array either. Um, and that kind of sucks. I can kind of understand the SAS versus SATA thing because I guess they want all the drives in the array speaking the same language. It probably makes it algorithmically easier and faster to synchronize the array and to do, you know, the same actions on all the disks, if they're mirrors, for example, or... Anyway, I can understand that. Um, to me, it seems a bit weird that you can't combine, let's say, SATA SSDs and SATA hard drives in the same array. I mean, you can combine 5400 RPM hard drives and 10K RPM hard drives in the same array. One's gonna be faster than the other, so why not SSDs and hard drives? If anyone knows the answer to that, let me know. I just don't know if it's like a, um, not a marketing gimmick, but like a money-making thing where they don't want you easily migrating to SSD arrays with generic SSDs. Maybe they want you to buy their product. I, I'm just speculating. I get paranoid about uh, HP and Dell and these other server manufacturers like overcharging for upgrades and add-ons. So at least overcharging in my opinion. I know they will say there are reasons for their prices, everything is vetted, everything is certified, everything is just the best that you could ever buy from anyone. And there is some truth to that, 
but uh, for me, it's not worth the price. And for a lot of people, it's not gonna be worth the price. In fact, if you're watching this video on how to convert an HP DL380 to be used with software RAID like FreeNAS or, you know, ZFS in any capacity, uh, you're probably not a huge enterprise looking for advice on how to store your mission critical hospital patient data records. You know, you're probably more a person like me who just likes fucking around with server hardware and uh, wants to get as much storage as possible, as cheaply as possible for their house or business. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I think I'm done. I think I've ranted enough for one night. Jesus Christ, it's turned into a long video. Uh, thank you for watching. It is four o'clock in the morning. Good night. Hi, camera. Pretty handsome, aren't you? Make a good co-host. A dusty co-host. <laughs>